Good evening and welcome to Dig This. My name is Tom Levy from the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, San Diego. Tonight, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Paul Goldstein, formerly of Dartmouth College. Paul is a New World archaeologist who has worked in South America for over 20 years. Good evening, Paul. Great to be here, Tom. Nice to see you. Welcome. Paul, um, along with Egypt, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, uh, South America, and Peru in particular, was home to one of the first pristine civilizations. What made you commit yourself to the study of ancient Peru? It's very interesting, Tom. Um, I actually went to graduate school thinking to be a Middle Eastern archaeologist like yourself, a Near Eastern archaeologist. And um, it was the early 80s, and there were no opportunities to work in that area. And my interest has always really been about the rise of complex societies. Where did the first states come from? Why do people choose to live in cities? Why did this happen, as you say, in independent parts of the world at different times? Um, and I had always had a sort of a side interest in the Andes until I had the opportunity to go there early in my training career. And um, I've never looked back. It's a fascinating part of the world. It's got a unique charm. Uh, simply being there is fascinating. Um, there are many aspects of living cultures that are uh, omnipresent and a real teaching experience when you try to project backwards into time about Andean complex societies. Um, and in addition, as an area to study sort of the problems that both of us are interested in, the formations of complex societies, the Andes is a little different. It's one of the exceptions when we generalize based on our independent case studies in several ways. So it makes it more fascinating. You know, uh, I would say the general public tends to think of the Incas as the archetypal South American civilization. Were the Incas the earliest? No, in fact, I sometimes think I like to subtitle my South American archaeology course, um, It Ain't Just Incas, because um, uh, the Incas were, in fact, one of the uh, latest of a long, long series, thousands of years, in fact, of Andean complex societies, uh, going well back into a period we call the pre-ceramic, uh, beginning as far back as 2000, uh, even 3000 BC. Uh, the Incas really only appeared on the scene a few hundred years before the Spaniards arrived as a major empire. And what, uh, could you just paint a picture of what the Inca civilization looked like? Well, the Inca civilization was above uh, all an empire in all senses of the world, uh, in all senses of the word. It had been recently put together, largely through military conquest. It encompassed an enormous diversity of different peoples. Um, so when you think of Peru and the entire extent of the Inca Empire, uh, which would have extended from modern-day Colombia to Chile, uh, an enormous uh, land empire, um, you also have to keep in mind that diversity, that mm -hmm. the Incas had come from one of many different independent ethnic groups, and in the space of really only a few hundred years, two or three hundred years at the most, uh, put together this uh, very diverse, multi-ethnic uh, empire through a patchwork of conquest, new administrative procedures, uh, and sometimes the consent of the people they governed. So it was a very new mm -hmm. and uh, very diverse phenomenon. And this is, in one way, the seed of its downfall at the hands of the Spaniards. The Spaniards knew how to exploit the uh, sort of centrifugal tendencies of an empire um, by looking for um, component groups that were uh, dissatisfied with Inca rule. How, how then were the Spanish able to subjugate the Inca and and take over, as it were. Well, the, the Spanish conquest of Peru is perhaps one of the most fabulous stories in Western history. Um, the idea that 168 men, and that's the size of Pizarro's third expedition that actually encountered and took over the empire, uh, could take over an empire that was of six million people living under Inca rule uh, is really a phenomenal concept. Um, the single most important factor, and there are many factors, there's horses and mm -hmm. metal weapons, um, surprise, uh, cognitive dissonance and the clash of cultures and so on, but the single most important factor uh, is probably a combination of political unrest, mm -hmm. but even the root cause of that would be the spread of European diseases throughout the Americas. Um, European diseases actually arrived in the Andes in South America before Europeans did. Before Pizarro showed up. That's right. And um, 
it, this probably came from village to village from the Caribbean where the first Spaniards arrived. And it's estimated that by the time Pizarro actually arrived in the Empire of the Incas. Which was around what year? 1532. Okay. Uh, as much as half of the population, perhaps even as many as 80% of the population, had been killed. So um, people were dying. This was part of their culture at the, at the end, as it were. Enormous amount of political unrest, complete social upheaval. Um, I mean, literally to have a cultural, uh, perhaps even decimated, taken down to one-tenth its size. Uh, the death of the uh, last ruler of a unified Inca empire was probably due to smallpox. Hmm. We don't know this because it happened before Europeans were on the scene, um, somewhere in the late 1520s. Uh, and that led to a war of succession uh, amongst his, his, his children. And um, that was one of the main political factors that Pizarro was able to exploit. Well, that's a very sad story indeed. Um, what then is the earliest uh, South American civilization? Well, I think as you know, as a complex society archaeologist, it depends on how you like to define civilization. Okay. Um, South American civilization tends to be a little less urbanized than some of our uh, comparative cases. Uh, so we're not really looking for the first cities as we are often in the Near East. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we see more monument building quite early on before we see real urban civilizations. And some of these go back as far as 3000 BC, when some of the coastal populations in Peru, perhaps even before they were um, doing agriculture, uh, living largely on maritime resources, started to build increasingly larger public monuments. When you say monuments, uh, could you describe what these things actually look like? Well, there's a wonderful uh, Peruvian term that actually comes from Quechua that we call um, these uh, wakas. But that really means pyramids or truncated mound-like earthen structures. And they're just large earthen structures, a variety of shapes. Uh, particular features vary from place to place and from uh, time to time, beginning in this pre-ceramic period uh, on up through what we call the initial period when pottery and agriculture become more important. Um, some of them are U-shaped. Mm -hmm. Some of the ones in the uh, Lima area in particular are U-shaped, usually facing towards the sunrise in the northeast. So these, uh, these early monuments, they, they signal the rise of this first uh, complex society or, or civilization, as we might say? Monument building is certainly a feature of civilization building. Um, but we have to look a little bit later to find the kind of political unification that we think of as state formation. And this takes place usually after the beginning of the current era um, with uh, a series of what we call horizons in Andean prehistory, um, which as one of their manifestations have some kind of cultural unification throughout the Andes, and at least in the case of the later two horizons, a political unification as well. So some kind of centralized government comes a little bit later in the story. Is this what's referred to as Tiwanaku, or maybe you could elaborate on that? Well, Tiwanaku is one of two civilizations that constitute what we call the middle horizon, which is really when we find states stretching their legs and starting to begin to do things that we associate with uh, state political entities and even empires. Um, there's some implication of outside conquest for Wari and Tiwanaku, and particularly in the case of Tiwanaku, there's an expansion through colonization mm -hmm. from an initial resource base in the very high altitude around Lake Titicaca in Bolivia and Peru. Um, so we start to see not only states by this time, this middle horizon, which begins around 500 AD, uh, and we also see the expansion of these states to new regions. Before we get into your own research and how you've tackled this problem in, in a very innovative way, I'm wondering if you could tell us something about the, the landscape in which this is happening. I, I, I somehow envision uh, a desert and, and rivers through the desert. What, what, did, what does it look like in Peru? Well, I mentioned that the Andes as a culture area have some significant differences with the other regions we've seen civilizations develop worldwide. Um, and part of this certainly owes to the Andes' unique um, ecological and geographical zonation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been described as a vertical geography in the sense that 
although we're in a tropical latitude for most of the regions we're talking about, um, there's an enormous variety of climate zones that are formed by the interaction of the Andean mountain chain itself, which is one of the highest chains in the world, um, coastal climate phenomena, uh, and latitude. So the combination of these factors leads to a unique and extremely varied, almost a smorgasbord of different environments. And a lot of the story about the rise of civilization has been about the ability of different civilizations to harness and manipulate this environmental diversity in interesting ways. Some of them are quite different than other civilizations. So in terms of rainfall, um, what does it look like, let's say, right on the coast and then as you work your way inland up to the Andes? This is a good way of thinking about the Andes in a kind of a cross-section. Mm -hmm. um, the coast is a sort of a contradiction in terms of human potential uh, mm -hmm. for exploiting the region. Uh, it's the rich, one of the richest maritime environments in the world because of the Humboldt Current, a cold current that runs uh, from the Antarctic uh, that leads to um, uh, an enormously uh, rich food chain mm -hmm. at several levels. So a big part of the story on the coast has been harnessing that maritime environment. At the same time, though, it, the same <coughs> climate phenomena, this cold current, is, uh, causes a rain shadow, mm -hmm. uh, which makes the coastal strip of Peru, and particularly the southern part of Peru into Chile, uh, the world's driest desert. It, it's actually drier than uh, any of the old world deserts in terms of annual rainfall. Mm -hmm. As one goes up the Andean mountain chain and goes higher and higher in ele elevation, um, this factor changes considerably. And at higher elevations, rainfall would not be the lack of rainfall would not be the problem for human societies, uh, but instead the elevation itself, the cold, and particularly nightly frosts, mm -hmm. and the different kinds of potentials for raising different crops, animals, and so on. Um, one, one crosses the Andean mountain chain and starts coming down the other side, we descend into what many people associate more with ancient South America, and that's a sort of an Amazonian environment where mm -hmm. rainfall is uh, omnipresent, it rains quite a bit, uh, and as you go lower and lower in elevation, you have an extremely biodiverse environment. So this enormous amount of variability is all really within a few hundred kilometers of linear distance. And the, um, the early civilizations like Tiwanaku, they were able to integrate all those different micro-environments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, assumption that a lot of us would have is that putting this all together and building a civilization would probably entail some kind of complex system of trade and markets. And this is certainly the way it would have gone in most of the civilizations we have worldwide. In the Andes, however, um, there seem to be several different ways of approaching the exchange of resources. And this is one of the other fascinating differences here, in that even the most complex and expansive of these Andean states, like the Inca, did not have a developed market system. They had mm. a largely non-market economy. Uh, which is somewhat unusual. We usually associate the growth of markets, states, and cities as one kind of package. And this part of it was missing to a large extent in the Andes. Hmm. What they did instead um, is integrate through other means of colonization and family-related or kin-tied connections. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, in your own research, you've um, come up with a very interesting metaphor, which you call in terms of envisioning these early states and so on, a vertical archipelago. And you look at uh, the role of diaspora communities in creating social change or maintaining change. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah. This is really, I have to say, not, not my concept entirely. It's uh, my application of it to archaeological time. Um, but it's a concept developed by an ethnographer, mm -hmm. an ethno-historian, someone who uses Spanish colonial documents to document indigenous Andean society, uh, named John Moore, mm -hmm. um, who came up with the concept of an archipelago as a kind of metaphor to describe how to establish resource islands in different parts of this ecological uh, mosaic that I described. Um, it's vertical because these are altitude-defined ecological zones. So it's advantageous for any community to establish outlier communities or small segments of their own community in different elevation-defined resource zones. Mm 
So you can, say, have a population, population center at a high elevation, but send small groups of farmers down to lower elevations to produce different crops that are available there. Would those be the diaspora that you're referring to, or is that linked to some kind of trade system? Well, the difference here that sort of links it to diaspora is that these outlier communities, instead of marketing and exchanging things in some kind of price-fixing uh, arrangement among different elevation-defined ecological zones, in fact have a reciprocity-based system, that their relationships are not through money and they're not through any kind of direct barter either. They're more based on strong feeling of identity with their communities that are maintained over long periods of time despite the fact that they're relocated to a different location. And this was something that Mura and uh, others reading the Spanish Chronicles have commented on, that the Spaniards were sometimes amazed as they went around trying to do a census, that people never really admitted to living where they seemed to live. They always claimed to be living somewhere else, despite the fact that they'd clearly lived there for generations in some cases. Well, in your work, you're an archaeologist. What are the archaeological correlates to identify these diaspora communities? Well, the problem with archaeology, as I'm sure you're aware of, is that we can't excavate mind. That's one thing we can never really do. We can't really dig up a mindset. And when we talk about identity, we're trying to get through from material artifacts and the context in which they're found uh, to reconstruct something about people's actual mindset of identity. Um, the best ways we can do this are through looking at material culture in context very carefully and looking for matches across distances in aspects particularly of everyday culture, uh, household activities, cuisine, choices in kinds of pots and cooking where to use as opposed to others, as well as in more obvious things like artistic styles, uh, burial practices, and so on. Um, and what we essentially find then are colonies that share a large part of their material culture, the artifacts, the context, the houses, uh, as well as we think large parts of this uh, process of identity, long-term identity. So how far would these uh <clears throat> diaspora communities be in distance from the core, like the Tiwanaku core areas? Well, Tiwanaku is, in a sense, kind of a prototype um, for patterns that we see later in the Inca period and at the time of the Spanish uh, conquest. Um, and it's a fairly small prototype. Um, if we think of Tiwanaku as a state, uh, its area is not particularly large overall. Um, and the greatest distances we find substantial colonies of producing agriculturalist Tiwanaku communities is within a few hundred kilometers, 300, 400 kilometers at the most. And Paul, in terms of the environment, what sort of environmental factors like El Nino events uh, may have promoted cultural change in, in the rise of complex societies? And, and what, is a, what is an El Nino event for that? Well, I think many of our viewers probably have a, uh, some idea about El Ninos because it's an effect uh, that's felt uh, worldwide. Um, the name actually was originated in, in uh, the Andean region because the event comes usually around Christmas time, hence El Nino, the, the child. Uh, but it is a reversal of global climate phenomena um, that begins in the Pacific, actually begins in the atmosphere, but we think of it as a, a Pacific uh, maritime event, um, that basically reverses all of the trends I mentioned earlier. The maritime resources of Peru disappear because that cold current disappears. The rain shadow along the coast is temporarily reversed with disastrous, catastrophic torrential rains where people don't want it to rain. Mm -hmm. And very often, at the same time, there are droughts in the highlands where it's expected to rain. In fact, rain and glacial snows are what recharge the entire agricultural base through irrigation. And ha how long a period of time are we talking about? Um, Years typ or? Typically, a Nino is a short-term event, it, uh, in geological time at least. It occurs one at a time on an annual basis. It mm -hmm. occurs often at a spacing that seems to average somewhere around seven years, but it's very irregular. Some have tied it to sunspot activities, um, but the actual timing of the events uh, is not predictable. 
And some scholars suggest that these El Nino events directly impacted upon social change? Yeah, um, the largest sort of body of scholarship suggests a kind of catastrophic interpretation of El Ninos, that it often is responsible, or at least, at least partially responsible, for the collapse of ancient civilizations. And this is something we're certainly examining in our uh, upcoming research. Where are you going to be working? Well, we're returning to the Moquegua Valley of southern Peru, where we've been working for some time uh, with a broad-based settlement pattern survey, regional settlement pattern survey. Um, and we're returning to be, follow up on a, a sort of an offshoot of this that we started in 1998, when we also started looking, in addition to documenting the long-term human occupation, uh, to documenting major flood events in this particular valley. And in an article we published in 2000, uh, my geomorphologist colleague and I um, were able to really date two extremely powerful El Nino events to about 700 and 1300 AD, AD 700 and AD 1300. Uh, and we're going back now to sort of refine that sequence a little further, look for other events perhaps of slightly lesser magnitude, and then tie them in to the cultural sequence, the comings and goings of these colonies uh, and different population groups in the valley. That sounds like a fascinating research project. We're looking forward to it, and we're very grateful to the generous support of the uh, Hellman Fellowship here at UCSD for starting this off this year. That's great. Um, you know, in closing, I'd like to address some of the, uh, some very important issues that deal with ethics and archaeology. And I was wondering if you could tell us what the most important ethical issues are facing South American archaeologists and anthropologists? I think something that all archaeologists travel with at all times is a knowledge that our database, unlike other scientists and social scientists, is disappearing. Um, what we call cultural patrimony or cultural resources are really endangered on a worldwide basis. And South America is just another example of this. Um, you can kind of break it down into two major vectors of destruction of our cultural heritage. And archaeologists can't help but be involved in preservation uh, activities to some degree. Uh, one would be um, the perpetual loss to, the, of, to our knowledge of the past from looting, the intentional destruction of archaeological sites to remove pieces um, for sale on the international art market. That, that's a really big problem in Peru? It has a very long tradition in Peru, and it's really gotten worse, with incre unfortunately, with increasing interest uh, in the West in the Peruvian past uh, that's sort of added a market factor to this. So pieces uh, are valuable financially in some sense as well as culturally. Um, and you really have to go to Peru and visit some of the sites where these pieces come from to see the enormous amount of destruction it causes. Uh, entire cemeteries are looted with bones scattered on the surface. And for us as scientists, the loss uh, is magnified because we lo lose forever the context, the whole assemblage of factors that tell us what these pieces might have meant to an ancient society. So you've got <clears throat> the destruction of the uh, archaeological heritage, as it were. That's a, a major problem. Are there other issues, ethical issues, facing uh, archaeologists down there? Well, the, the second major vector of destruction is even more, uh, more, more thorny in some ways, because we now understand the dangers of looting, and we can at least uh, caution against people becoming interested in pieces as pieces, as pieces of art without understanding their cultural context. Um, at the same time, though, development is causing an enormous amount of site destruction. And it's very hard to go to an underdeveloped country and try to uh, slow down development to preserve the past. Um, but every time a new highway is built, a new power line, uh, a new agricultural canal, sites are destroyed. It's almost inevitable. It cannot be avoided. What we can try to do is mitigate some of this destruction. Um, there was recently a case of a housing uh, development uh, in Lima. Some very poor people need housing, um, and they happen to hit upon an Inca cemetery. So uh, obviously, we have to take some kind of a stance that uh, mitigates this destruction, but at the same time um, doesn't stand in the way of some of the development these countries are crying for.
And finally, what about um, your interaction as a scholar, uh, a Western scholar, with the local population? Are there ethical issues involved there in how you, do you have to give something back to the communities where you work? Is this a consideration? I think this is part of the heritage of international archaeology um, that has changed enormously in recent years. Um, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, archaeologists took the past from other countries and took it back and put it in their own museums. And this doesn't go on anymore. This is really something that's, we hope, a thing of the past. Um, we, in my area, we've built a regional museum. Everything I've ever excavated is still in Peru. It's still in the regional museum. Much of it is in storage for future uh, scholars to research. And a large part of it does go into public education. There is a very active school program uh, that visits the museum, that sometimes participates in workshops, uh, beginning at the primary school level. Um, so I think it's an obligation, and we hope to meet this obligation as much as possible, um, to use the knowledge we have and the resources we bring to bear in archaeology um, to give this past back to the people who are actually the inheritors of these traditions. Um, and I think we've been successful. I think over the years, working in the same area for many years, I've actually seen, uh, when I go out into the country, one of the things you do in survey is you almost go door to door uh, sometimes. You mean and to ask for permission? To ask for permission. Can I walk through your field? Can I you know, uh, visit that hill on the other side of your house? And so on. Um, very often at this point, after being there for a few years, it's very gratifying to meet no longer children, sort of young adults who, oh yeah, we've heard about this. Uh, we've been to the museum. Uh, you know, we've had some section in our primary school and secondary school about the ancient cultures. And there's a rising consciousness that the past is there to preserve, um, and not simply to ransack. Well, that's, uh, those are very important ethical issues facing archaeologists. And I'd like to wish you good luck in your forthcoming research. And thank you for being on the show tonight. And uh, I hope you'll come again. Thank you, Tom. It's great to have a chance to talk like this. And I'd like to thank our viewers. Uh, my name's Tom Levy, and it's been a pleasure to be with you this evening on Dig This.